Well, I just want to welcome you this um, rainy day in Southern California. I re I'm reminded of a song. You know the song. Uh, it never rains in Southern California, and it in some ways is a bit of a, a parallel to this notion that we'll, we'll, it will never have a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, or we'll never be able to overturn Citizens United. And I have news for the world. Uh, it's raining in Southern California, which it does actually from time to time. And uh, I do believe we're going to overturn Citizens United, which we have done uh, in our history. Many times, in fact, 27 times, and I think uh, eventually 28 times. Um, and so I'm especially honored to uh, be the moderator of this panel, and I have the prerogative as the, as the moderator um, to give some opening remarks. Um, and so let me just thank Mary Beth and Anjali, who've been tremendous, and the whole team out here organizing this effort, and Greg Nojime for, or, or pardon me, <laughs> Greg Colvin, uh, Greg Colvin for organizing this panel, for reaching out to uh, these amazing uh, intellects uh, to help organize a discussion of some of the very complex issues involved in um, this issue of corporate rights, but not just for-profit corporate rights, non-profit corporate rights rights or privileges, as well as this complex set of issues that we see unfolding in, in between the, the, the rhetoric in some ways and the reality of what's been happening in the campaigns, at least in this, these first three years since Citizens United. So let me just back up a second because you are going to hear from me and, and Marge Baker later today about some of the amendments uh, that are going on. And we do have a very lengthy document for you that's out front that has the amendments, but you don't have to read them today. There won't be a test. But there is actually a very robust debate and discussion going on. And I have to say that I found uh, Professor Lessig's presentation to be very inspiring. Uh, very illuminating on a lot of points. At the same time, I would say to you, in fairness, that we don't share all the same conclusions um, about what those insights would lead to. But that's fine because we're at the beginning of a very big conversation in our nation about how to solve these very, very enormous problems about corporate influence on our democracy, but beyond corporate influence and control and manipulation of our democracy, the influence of some of the richest people in our country and in our world on our democracy. And so I think that there are a lot of wonderful things that, are, that are, have been discussed. There's a conversation about um, the importance of having small donations, and restoring the power of people um, to you know, really have much more say in giving to candidates. And I think that's a very important, a very important effort. Um, and at the same time, I would tell you from my research standpoint, uh, for the Center for Media Democracy, where we published a lot of this work on prwatch.org, um, what we saw was in the presidential race, as you know, one candidate who raised a lot, more, a lot more money from fewer people, and a candidate who raised, you know, a similar amount of money from more people, uh, you know, on the small donation front versus the bigger donation front. But in some ways, that issue, as important as it is, does not illuminate a larger issue that we've observed which is that the candidates were absolutely outspent by outside groups. This election was the most expensive election in US history. It was the most expensive election in the history of the world, of the history of the world. And more dark money, not money that went to the candidates that you could see Sheldon Adelson uh, uh, giving big you know, million dollar checks, not just the big money that went in the super PACs, which was disclosed, although there is uh, some, uh, some cloaking of that, as Professor Levinson said, in terms of what goes into the super PAC fund. But money to nonprofit organizations uh, that are organized under the Eternal Revo Revenue Code, known as 501c3s and c4s and c5s and c6s, which I won't get into. I had 12 minutes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Ah, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, well, um, so uh, the the light just went on, but um, so um, and and so in essence, um, in essence, what we've seen is an explosion of dark money, of dark money, and so and in fact, the candidates know that there's an explosion of dark money. You could see that in the the candidates' super PACs that were independent. <laughs> of the candidates, which were led by, in many cases, their treasurer, their campaign strategist, and their lawyer in their previous campaign, then went over the super PAC to raise unlimited funds 
from unlimited sources to spin in an unlimited way, but that wasn't enough because the outside groups, Carl Rove's crossroads operation, he had a part that was a super PAC and a part that was not a super PAC, that was a nonprofit group in which you have no idea who those donors are. We um, saw that. We saw in this election uh, the, the beginnings of some of the tale of that corruption, and it is about corruption. Professor Lissig's precisely right. This is, a, this is a conversation about corruption. That conversation about corruption is nonpartisan. It's, in essence, transpartisan, cross-partisan. But the corruption that we've seen so far has not been transpartisan. The most glaring examples have been partisan. You have a group in Montana promoting to their donors in PowerPoint presentations that you can give unlimited money to them and the best benefit is it's secret and you can watch the results come in on election day and no one will ever know that you influenced that election. That's what the PowerPoint presentation said for the Western tradition group, the American tradition group. Um, you saw here in California when the California Elections Board got involved in looking at who was funding uh, one of the anti-proposition uh, anti efforts, uh, it, it turned out to be a shell group. One group that was getting funding from another shell group that, in essence, was getting funding from probably another shell group. We, in my little world of the Center for Media Records, we call that big secret bucks. We call that dark money, and that we've got to uncloak that dark money. And we're actually calling for an investigation of, uh, of the Koch brothers and of anyone else who's giving dark money. Because even though, uh, as, uh, as the other professors have said, this is not necessarily illegal, although I think that there was some illegal activity in this campaign, in this election overall, um, Congress has the power to investigate things not just because they're illegal or not legal, but because they have jurisdiction, jurisdiction to enforce our laws and to investigate what's going on. And in fact, in 1996, after the 1996 election, Congress did investigate the machinations in that 1996 race and began an investigation of the Koch brothers' early operations, but the subpoenas to the Kochs were quashed. But I don't want to get into that in too much detail because I want to go back another step, which is to say, the question of transparency is very vital. The work to get knowledge about who these corporations are, or who the individuals are who are donating to different groups that are very active in campaigns, whether they're using the magic words, as, as Jessica Levin said, or not, whether they're saying vote for or against or not, that's big. But the fact is, we have a lot of that data, but we can't run a million dollars worth of ads <coughs> after their ads, saying don't listen to that ad because that is funded by you know, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, which is really you know, this Texas billionaire because of the way the system is structured. And so I guess what I would submit to you is that there's a lot of complicated issues about how to deal with corporate rights, whether they're, uh, whether they're described as constitutional, whether they're statutory. Uh, there's a lot of complicated issues about how to deal with the, the rights of small donors versus big donors. There are a lot of very important questions, and this panel is going to, I hope, illuminating, illuminate some of those. Um, as someone who has tracked some of these front groups, Citizens for a Strong America, Americans for Job Security, Americans for this, Americans for that, um, you know, it's a pop-up, it's a whole pop-up operation. It's a cottage industry. <laughs> um, there, you can get disclosure of the group that gave to the group, but you're not getting much illumination. And so we have a lot of work to do. And there are profoundly powerful things that are happening. Um, as, as has been mentioned, there's uh, two states passed resolution, resolutions directing uh, that, that their members of Congress basically move to overturn Citizens United. 11 states overall have embraced this. I'm not going to go through all the math because I think Derek is going to talk about some of that at some point. But um, we've got hundreds of resolutions. And those resolutions are powerful because they're the beginning of this movement. And there are, there are groups that are not in this room on these panels who are part of that conversation, move to amend, uh, uh, people for the American way, um, uh, um, public citizen, uh, common cause, uh, communications workers of America, some of the unions. So there's a very big, powerful, amazing conversation that, as, as, as Professor Lissig said, has, this gift of Citizens United has helped uh, unveil and helped provoke. Um, but I prefer to think of this circumstance as a little bit like making soup. You can't have a one flavor soup or you know it's really pretty bland. You actually have to have a lot of different flavors. A lot of flavors come together to make this soup. Or maybe the better analogy is jazz. You have a lot of different experts. Uh, maybe you've got progressive groups that are doing this and, and uh, Republican groups that are doing that and some transpartisan groups that are doing this or that. And overall, 
what you're hoping to build is a movement for change that gets to a tipping point that enables a lot of things, that makes a lot of more things possible. And because the devil is in the details, I'm very pleased to present to you the panel today, who's gonna to get into some of those details about these very naughty, not naughty, um, <laughs> issues about corporate constitutional rights and statutory rights and nonprofit rights um, or privileges. And so without further ado, I'd like to present to you Elizabeth Pullman from Loyola Law School. Thank you. Is this one working? That's on. Do you want to stand or do you want to? Okay. It will be fast this way. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. And thanks to everyone that was involved in making this very important day happen. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, first, I'd like to situate corporate constitutional rights, or what might be called corporate personhood, in the larger context of corporate personality issues. And then two, focus in on corporate constitutional rights uh, and provide a brief overview of what rights corporations have that have been recognized by the Supreme Court. And in doing this, I'll pick up on some points that professors Jessica Levinson and Adam Winkler made earlier. Um, but what I'd like to do is take an even broader view and provide kind of a, a more simple, my way of thinking of this with a mental or conceptual framework to parse out the different corporate personality issues and then putting in historical context the development of constitutional rights for corporations. Uh, I've written a short paper on this for the, uh, for the conference as well, which is available on the website. So first, situating corporate uh, constitutional rights within the realm of corporate personality. The idea of corporate personality is comprised of a few conceptually distinct notions or ideas. One, the entity status of corporations. Two, statutory issues, uh, which you could also put into this category, perhaps, state constitutional issues. And three, the treatment of corporations under the US Constitution. So I'll say a bit about each of these. First, the entity status of corporations under the law, or what I might call legal personality. Legal personality was established long before the question even arose about how to treat corporations under the US Constitution. Uh, by at least as early as the 18th century, and perhaps quite a bit earlier, English law had established corporations as having certain abilities or uh, characteristics under the law. And the idea was that members could be united into a corporation and that there would be this legal fiction that that thing would be treated like a separate entity under the law. And the things that flowed from this idea of legal personality included the ability to contract in the name of the corporation, the ability to hold property in the corporate name, and to sue and be sued in the corporate name. It also included a conception of the corporation as potentially having perpetual existence, uh, or at least an existence that wasn't tied to the lifespans of its members, in contrast to the partnership form of business. Limited liability for shareholders developed over time. So the idea of a separate corporate existence was important because of these abilities. It allowed corporate participants to lock in capital to that separate entity and to partition corporate assets from the assets of the participants. This is core to what the corporation is in many ways. Uh, it's what made the corporate form so useful for raising capital from a broad group of investors and building lasting institutions. And this is part of what arguably has fueled uh, our economic development in our country uh, and spurred the Industrial Revolution and a lot of economic growth. So that's entity status or legal personality. Second situating point of corporate personality. Statutory laws, both state and federal, have often included corporations in their definitions section, either expressly referring to corporations in the relevant statutory text uh, or defining the term person to include corporations to make clear that the statute applies to corporations. Statutes that do not expressly include corporations or define person to mean corporations 
can give rise to ambiguity because of this custom that we have of some statutes doing that. And when we have that sort of ambiguity, it often has to be resolved by the courts. So for example, last year in FCC v. AT&T, the Supreme Court held that corporations don't have a personal privacy right for purposes of the Freedom of Information Act, um, which protects disclosure from uh, certain law enforcement records. So corporations don't have that as a matter of statutory interpretation. Currently before the Supreme Court this year, uh, in Keobel v. Royal Dutch Petroleum is, amongst other issues, the question of whether the alien tort statute passed by Congress in 1789 uh, applies to corporations or only to human beings directly. And so this year the court may address whether corporations can be sued in the US, in US courts under the alien tort statute for human rights violations that occurred entirely in another country. So these cases illustrate that how there may be questions of statutory interpretation regarding whether corporations are covered in light of language concerning persons or the like, and, and they may be uh, quite important. Finally, there's the question of how to treat corporations under the US Constitution. So I'm still talking about this universe of what do we mean when we say a corporation is a person, and I've said there's the entity status, there's the statutory issues, and now I'm talking about what a lot of people talk about when they talk about corporate personhood, which is how do we treat corporations under the US Constitution, given that the US Constitution doesn't specifically refer to corporations. And so it's been left to the courts to figure out whether corporations can be the subject of constitutional protections, that is rights holders, and whether those rights would be coextensive with the rights of individuals. Uh, so the Supreme Court, as Professor Adam Winkler mentioned, hasn't addressed these issues in uh, a holistic way. Rather, the court has made incremental decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and without a unified theory of what a corporation is. And that's led to some inconsistencies in the court's reasoning over time. Uh, and in sum, over time, on an ad hoc basis, the court has recognized corporations as having a panoply of rights. Not necessarily the same as what individuals have, but I would call it a panoply. Uh, and I think of it in terms of three kind of broad categories. Rights associated with contract and property interests, rights associated with trials and searches, and rights associated with speech. So now I'm focusing in specifically on that second part of what I want to do, give this broad overview of what constitutional rights corporations have. And to put it in a bit of historical context, so over there you see pre-1800, we have the US Constitution that doesn't specifically refer to corporations. And then in the 1800s, we have the first cases concerning corporate constitutional rights. And they concerned contract and property interests. Uh, Professor Winkler talked about that 1819 case, Dartmouth College. That was one of the earliest cases. And the Supreme Court recognized that corporations were protected by the Contracts Clause of the Constitution, which forbids a state from impairing existing contractual obligations. And the court reasoned that the corporate charter represented a contract between the individuals who incorporated the entity, that separate entity, and the state. And therefore, the state couldn't unilaterally amend the charter of a private college and effectively convert it into a public uh, institution. So for contracts clause purposes, this recognized the corporation as a contract creating a separate entity through which people carried on business or identified objectives, and it protected the individuals behind the entity. In the late 1800s, the Supreme Court established constitutional protection of corporate property. And here we get to that famous Santa Clara case, uh, which is often traced to this time as the root of the corporate personhood doctrine. It, it's kind of just become so well known that uh, that's how people like to refer to it. Uh, but there's, there's a lot more context to that. Since uh, Professor Winkler discussed the case in some detail, I'm just going to underscore the fact that that decision came in the context of property. And uh, I think it's also important to note that there were other cases right around that time in which it wasn't just in the head notes, it was in the opinion. And the court considered these issues and said, uh, corporations have also Fifth and 14th Amendment due process protections for corporate property. And the idea was that 
corporate property is indirectly individual's property. Uh, so in the 19th century, in the 1800s, the court recognized corporations as having the protection of the contracts clause and the protection of the 14th and 5th Amendment in the context of property. In the early 1900s, the court began to recognize corporations as having certain rights associated with trials and searches. And this came about because corporations were now being held subject to criminal liability. Early common law didn't impose criminal responsibility on corporations because courts had been struggling, these early courts, with the idea of what is a corporation and can we attribute an act and an intent to a corporation as we could to a criminal defendant, an individual. But by the early 20th century, these, the early 1900s, Courts had started to take a broader approach by importing tort and agency principles to hold corporations vicariously liable for criminal acts performed by their corporate agents. In addition, federal regulation of economic activity through criminal statutes like antitrust laws uh, had grown by this time in the early 1900s, in part also because of that industrial revolution and now there was this more corporations, quite frankly, in the country, and they were bigger and had a uh, bigger impact on daily life. And uh, so this had queued up issues concerning the government's power to prosecute corporations. In 1909, uh, in New York Central, the Supreme Court definitively answered that question and recognized corporate criminal liability based on the doctrine of this vicarious liability responding at superior. And around this time came that case that Professor Winkler mentioned uh, Hale v. Henkel, in which the court said corporations have some Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable searches and seizures, but corporations don't have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And it seems like the court's treatment of corporations, it didn't rest on some textual basis of saying a corporation is a person, they get all these rights. It was much more pragmatic. Uh, because the Fourth Amendment uses the word people and the Fifth Amendment similarly uses the word person. So it wasn't just based on saying a corporation is a person. Uh, it, it looks like pragmatism drove that decision as granting corporations the privilege against self-incrimination could have significantly impeded corporate criminal liability that was growing at the time. Uh, whereas recognizing corporations as having some Fourth Amendment rights wouldn't have entirely shielded corporations from that prosecution. Also noteworthy is that in thinking about this uh, trials and searches rights that was happening in the 1900s, is that the court didn't say that the protection of corporations was coextensive with the rights of individuals. It gave some rights to corporations in this context of trials and searches, but it didn't necessarily say that it was the same scope of protection. Uh, and besides ruling on the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, privilege against self-incrimination. The court also addressed uh, other constitutional protections. It recognized that corporations could claim the protection of the double jeopardy clause, and seemingly that corporations have sixth and seventh amendment entitlements to trial by jury in at least some contexts. Some open questions still remain about the uh, rights related to trials and searches of corporations. Uh, open questions include whether corporations have protection against the Eighth Amendment uh, excessive fines, whether corporations receive protection under the Sixth and Seventh uh, or Sixth Amendment assistance of counsel clause, and whether corporations have a right to be indicted by a grand jury. Those are open questions. Finally, we get to speech rights. And this is what I think is useful about putting this in historical context. Uh, jurisprudence regarding corporate speech rights is of the most recent vintage and has arguably reflected the greatest expansion of corporate rights. It was not a given that corporations would have these rights or that they would be at all comparable in breadth as those that individuals enjoy. Because as we've seen, the court said co corporations don't have a Fifth Amendment uh, privilege against self-incrimination. Also, corporations are not citizens uh, under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Corporations don't have a right to vote. Uh, and, with bit, and with limited exception, that gross gene case that was mentioned earlier, the question of corporate speech didn't arise until about the 1970s. 
And in the 1970s, the Supreme Court recognized corporations as having some rights in the context of commercial speech, which is that Virginia pharmacy case that Professor Winkler was discussing, as well as political speech, like the Bilotti case that Professor Levinson was discussing. So I'm gonna leave it there because I think they, uh, I don't need to cover that ground again, but um, I'm happy to answer questions and I turn it over to my next co-panelist. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Barbara Romberg. I'm very pleased to be here today. And I have a unique role here at the conference because I was asked not to look at federal constitutional law or campaign finance law, but rather to look at the idea of corporate personhood under other laws. If the Constitution were amended to provide that corporations were not people, would our concept of corporate personhood disappear? So I looked at three areas of law for this survey, and I looked at about seven state laws in particular to see what they said. I looked at the authorizing statutes that create corporations, and I looked at all the rest of the state and federal laws that regulate behavior for corporations and all the rest of us, and I looked at state constitutions. Now on the authorizing statutes, as was quoted here before, the Supreme Court has long held that corporations, being creatures of law, have only the powers that they are granted under uh, the authority of legislatures. As long ago as 1804, the Supreme Court said, the act of incorporation is, for them, speaking of corporations, an enabling act. It gives them all the powers they possess. And that view of corporations as having legislatively conferred powers has never really been questioned as a judicial matter. They're creatures of law. So what do these laws that authorize corporations say? Most corporations in the United States are created under state law. They're incorporated in one of the 50 states under laws enacted in that state to provide for the formation of business corporations and other kinds of corporations. Now, all state laws nowadays provide that corporations can be formed for any lawful business or any lawful purpose. And along with these broad purposes, corporations are generally given very broad powers. Um, several states and the Model Business Corporation Code, which is very influential, provide that a corporation has the same powers as an individual to do all the things necessary or convenient to carry out its business and affairs. And even states that don't use that phrasing, the powers of an individual, use the necessary and convenient part. So I think every state law I looked at says that a corporation has all the powers necessary and convenient to carry out its business. Its business, which can be anything lawful. Now, it wasn't always this way. In the early days of the United States, uh, early incorporation statutes might have provided a corporation could only be formed for a specific purpose, like building a railroad or a canal. And then later, corporations could be formed for broader purposes, but the articles of incorporation that formed it had to say what the purpose was. And a corporation would be deemed to have all the powers given to it explicitly by statute and those implied by its purpose. So a corporation to build a canal would have the applied power to hire ditch diggers to dig the canal, because you couldn't build a canal without hiring people to dig the canal. But there was a lot of questions then. How far did those implied powers go? Did they have the powers to uh, pay pensions to the ditch diggers? Did corporations have the powers to own stock in another corporation? Did they have the power to make charitable gifts? How did that help you build the canal? And there's even a few isolated cases about whether they had the power to make political contributions or engage in political spending or if that was outside the powers of the corporation. Now in the 1800s and early 1900s, this led to a lot of litigation in courts about whether acts were outside the powers of a corporation. It's called ultra viris. Was something within the powers of the corporation or not? And you'd have to look at the state statutes and also their articles of incorporation. And I think states sort of thought it was a nuisance uh, because states have mostly gotten rid of that litigation about what's within the powers of the corporation. And they've done it partly uh, by allowing corporations to be formed for any lawful purpose. They don't have to state what their purpose is. And providing very broad broadly that they have any power necessary or convenient to carry out that business. And whether something is necessary or convenient to carry out their business, if you as a, a shareholder, for example, go to court to challenge that, would be judged under a very differential business judgment rule. Did the corporate officers and directors uh, you know, reasonably think, and in their business judgment, it was gonna advance the interests of the corporation. 
So nowadays, I don't think there's really any doubt that corporations have the power under their authorizing statutes to make political contributions if they can justify it as being necessary or convenient to carrying out their business purposes. So when you hear those sweeping languages about corporations being creatures of law, they have only the powers given to them by law, you might wonder, well, could we turn the clock back? Could we go back to the days and say, well, just change the laws. Corporations won't have the power to make political contributions anymore, and we'll solve the problem that way. I don't think that's really very practical because corporations are, for the most part, incorporated in the states. And the state laws that give them their powers and regulate what they are allowed as a legal entity to do are in the state level. They're judged under state law. So a Delaware corporation, its powers are judged under Delaware law. And if you form a corporation in California, it'd be judged under California law. And corporations can move. They can reincorporate. And where they're incorporated doesn't necessarily have anything to do with where they do their business. Most of the Fortune 500, or at least a goodly portion of it, is incorporated in Delaware. So I think it'd be very difficult to change the corporate powers at the state level. Because uh, Nevada is not going to pass a law that says its corporation can't engage in political spending because they'd be afraid that everybody, other corporations would take their charters and their franchise fees to Delaware. And Delaware isn't going to pass that law because they'd be afraid everyone would move back to Nevada. So uh, there's been a lot of academic commentary among corporate law professors about how much competition there is among the states for corporate charters, but I think it's very unlikely you'd have any real political reform through changing their authorized powers. Now, this doesn't mean that states gave up on regulating corporations. They just don't do it by restricting their powers as a legal entity. They do it by making them subject to all the laws that regulate business and other behavior. So the second area I looked at was corporate personhood under all the rest of these laws, that laws at state and federal level that tell us what people are allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, and what I found is it's extremely, extremely common to define the term person as a corporation. The very first section of the United States Code states, let's see, in determining the meaning of any act of Congress, unless the context indicates otherwise, the word person and whoever include corporations, companies, associations, firms, partnerships, societies, and joint stock companies, as well as individuals. Having defined person to mean all these types of business entities, federal laws are commonly worded to control the behavior of persons or give rights to persons, even when the laws are primarily intended to affect businesses. For example, a federal law that's regulating mortgage origination and what you have to disclose when you're making a mortgage might expect that most of those mortgages are gonna be given by businesses, but the law will define what persons have to do, what a person has to do. And that's the way the federal codes are drafted. It's also the case that most state laws are drafted that way. Several states I looked at are like uh, the federal law, that there's one definition of person that covers the whole code. Delaware's like that. Um, Texas is almost there. It has a single definition of person that applies to most of the laws. But even the state laws that don't have one definition of person covering the whole law, those laws are just peppered with definitions of per person. Uh, when you search, you'll find dozens of instances in each state code. Uh, if they don't have a general definition of person, saying for the purposes of this law, or this section, or this chapter of the law, person means a corporation, and might go on to list partnerships, business trusts, limited liability companies, or other business entities. That's not the only way you could draft laws to cover corporations and other business entities. We could certainly think of other ways. We could say for every statute you wrote, you would say it's unlawful for a person, a corporation, a partnership, a trust, a limited liability company, association, or any other entity to do this. And it's unlawful for a person, a corporation, a limited liability company, a partnership to do that. That would be another way. Or you could define a term for an entity or something like that. We could draft the laws in other ways, but that's not how they are drafted. It's a very predominant drafting technique at both the state and federal level to define person to include a corporation. And one point I'd like to emphasize is these laws are defining person to include a corporation is generally not to empower the corporations. That is not the purpose of the definitions. The purpose is to make it crystal clear that corporations are subject to the laws. They have to obey them, and they can be penalized if they don't 
obey them in any manner the law allows. So corporate personhood and statutory law is as much as anything a technique of corporate control. It's a way to regulate businesses and make them subject to the same laws and every business that's engaged in certain activities is subject to the same laws, whether it's an individual or a partnership or a corporation. Um, now, the th last thing I looked at was state constitutions. Every state has a constitution, and I think every state constitution has some version of its own Bill of Rights or Declaration of Rights. Many of them are modeled, at least in part, on the Federal Bill of Rights and guarantee citizens of the state certain protections. Now, um, a state constitution can't trump federal law. Under the US Constitution, federal law is always uh, supreme over state law, will always preempt a state law that conflicts. So a state level protection doesn't enable uh, a corporation or any individual to escape the impact of a federal law, but it can have an impact on state laws. And all the state constitutions I looked at I looked at a few things. I looked at, do they have a free speech clause? And they all do. The wording varies from state to state uh, somewhat. But every state constitution had a free speech clause. I looked at whether every state constitution had a due process clause, and they all did. Something that guaranteed persons or citizens, depending on the wording, due process. And I also looked at takings, whether there's a provision of the state constitution preventing taking a property without compensation, and they all had that. So, Turning back to that free speech area, state constitutions have free speech rights. Our constitution in California has a free speech right. If the federal constitution was amended so that corporations no longer had First Amendment rights under the federal constitution, that wouldn't necessarily affect how our state free speech clause was interpreted. So, Corporations have been held in California, actually, to have some rights under the uh, state free speech provision in the Constitution, under a logic very much like the Bellotti case that was mentioned. It's not so much that the corporation has the right to say it, it's that people have the right to hear it, and that society has an interest in the free flow of ideas. So how would that affect campaign finance at the state level? Now, if you look at state constitutional cases, it's very hard to tease out what are the rights under the state constitution and what are the rights under the federal constitution. Because if a court is considering both, there's a tendency to look most to the federal precedents because if you can't pass a law under the federal constitution, then it doesn't matter whether the state court would allow it or not, right? If the state constitution would allow it. So if you take away that First Amendment protection from corporations under the federal constitution, I think we see a lot more litigation under the state constitutions. And a lot of the same kinds of decisions that have prevented campaign finance reform measures from taking effect at the federal level under federal constitutional principles might continue to affect whether states could enact campaign finance reform at the state level for state offices of the governor and the legislatures, and very crucially in states that elect judges, state judicial elections. So one thing to consider is if you want campaign finance reform that's going to be available at the state level, you have to also look at those state constitutional rights um, and what authority states would have to regulate campaign finance. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, say say a few things. So, um, oh, move over to the mic. Yes, got it. Um, so, I, I think some of this conversation is very deep uh, in terms of in the weeds, but it, in some ways it's not really deep because it's this question of how do you craft solutions, and are some of those solutions being discussed going to solve the full range of these problems? And so, um, or are there other solutions that should be part of this conversation to deal with? the statutory reality or the state constitutional reality um, or the other parts that uh, Chara and Lynn and uh, uh, Grave Colvin are going to be talking about. And so we wanted to really take your time this morning to 
dig into this. Not the AV person. <laughs> so, do you want to proceed without your present, without your PowerPoint, or? Or do you want to? You want to switch? Yeah, let's. Switch. Okay. Yeah, no. And since you've stood up, I am both too short and too restless. <laughs> All right. To do this in a seat, so you're welcome Lynn, to take my Lynn seat. Lynn Stout is coming up. Lynn yeah, Stout no, is coming thank up. You. Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert in constitutional law or election law, uh, but I am an expert in corporations. And so what I want to talk about um, is the more fundamental question of what is it that corporations are, what is it that they do, and what are the rights that in a perfect world we would want them to have so that they can do what we want them to do. So I want to start off with a legal reality that has been mentioned several times today and that Mitt Romney got completely wrong. You remember Mitt Romney said, corporations are people, my friend. No, Mitt, they're not. Corporations are legal persons, as the Supreme Court has reminded us in the Citizens United case. And that is different from being people or even an association of people. So one point I want to make is that I think one of the most dangerous traps that even experts often fall into is something I call the anthropomorphic fallacy. They want to think of corporations as somehow people or a group of people, as opposed to recognizing them for what they are, which is very powerful institutions that humans have indeed created, but that have motives and purposes that might be quite different from our human motives and purposes. And another word that you often see thrown about, a phrase that's used that I worry about because I think it's dangerous and misleading, is to speak of corporations as legal fictions. There's nothing fictional about an Exxon or a General Motor. <laughs> they are very powerful entities. All right. Nevertheless, I think it's fair to acknowledge that these legal persons only exist because we organic human beings decided to create them. As a species, we got dibs. We were here first, and I think we should embrace the idea that as the species that got here first, we should be fully comfortable with saying, we are the ones who get to describe what rights and powers the legal person should have, and legal person should exist only and to the extent that they generate benefits for living, breathing human beings. And <laughs> we tolerate these legal persons because they can and should benefit people, including future generations of people. And a consequence of that is that we should see exactly what we have seen in the law, the pattern that has been described by our previous speakers, which is that we give legal persons certain kinds of rights and we do not give them other kinds of rights because there are certain kinds of rights legal persons have that allow them to work for the benefit of organic human beings and there are other kinds of rights that we fear that if we gave legal persons those rights, they could actually use them to work against the interests of organic human beings. The best example I can think of is you really don't want to give a corporation the right to vote. Why? because anyone who has 49 bucks in their pocket can create a corporation. And we would very swiftly see that the number of votes cast by corporations could easily outnumber the number of votes cast by organic human beings. All right, so we need to take what I view as a functionalist approach to deciding what rights legal persons should have. And that raises the inevitable question, what is the functional right of legal persons? I specialize in corporations, including both nonprofit corporations and for-profit corporations. And if you were dis to distill the economic function of these entities down into its very essence, their primary function is to own assets that they accumulate and retain so that those assets can generate benefits to human beings over time. So why does the Nature Conservancy exist? It exists so it can own, in its own name, millions of acres of land that it can preserve and protect for the benefit of present and future generations. Why does General Motors exist? It exists so that it can own assets, auto manufacturing plants, that it can retain and protect 
so that over generations, those auto manufacturing plants can generate benefits for human beings, including not only the people who buy the cars, but the people who work for the company and the taxpayers who receive the benefit of the income tax payments that General Motors makes on its corporate income. Once you understand corporations in particular, both profit and nonprofit, as legal institutions we've created to own assets over time, possibly in perpetuity, for the benefit of present and future generation of human beings, you realize that the rights they absolutely need to have are the rights to own property and to protect the property they own and to enter contracts so that they can increase the value of that property, rearrange the uses of that property. All right, what about the First Amendment? Well, here is where we get to Bilotti. And I find that my own view is I agree, once you recognize that corporations are legal persons that own assets so that they can generate benefits for humans in the future, we also, I think, need to recognize that there is room for them to have First Amendment rights of speech. Why? Because if they do not have speech rights, their right to own property can very easily be threatened and their property can be expropriated. And we tend to forget in the United States what happens in legal regimes where property is easily expropriated because it's not easily expropriated in the United States, but there are plenty of other nation states in the world where governments can easily expropriate private property. And the long-term consequences that those states, do not, those states do not thrive, do not develop economically, do not generate a good life for their citizens. So what happens if we give corporations the right to own property but no right to speak? What happens is a rich individual, like a Carl Icahn, goes to Congress and spends tons of money trying to get public support for a proposal that says we should have fracking on all the lands owned by the Nature Conservancy. Yeah. What happens when corporations don't have speech rights? A corporation that runs a wind farm has to worry that the Koch brothers, who do work in oil extraction, will ma a massive public campaign that says, you know, these wind farms are killing wild birds. We need to shut those wind farms down. So there has to be room, I think, for corporations to have speech rights. But that doesn't mean their First Amendment rights should be coextensive with the rights of organic human beings. There's another First Amendment right, the right to privacy, that I would suggest is not functionally necessary for most of our profit, for-profit and non-profit corporations to do the job we want them to do to generate benefits for human beings. And in fact, we actually have a very good model of how you can drive corporations to produce better results for human beings by requiring them to make extensive disclosures. And that is the model of the publicly held corporation that since 1933 and 1934, under the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Act of 1934, have had to make extensive disclosures of, among other things, their political um, involvement. So I actually looked, if you look at the firms and the individuals that are generating most of the money that leads to the kind of corruption that Larry Lessig was describing this morning, you will find that it's not necessarily public corporations that are the biggest part of the problem. It is the private companies, the company, you know, the Cook Industries, Sheldon Adelson's gambling business. Those are private companies not subject to disclosure requirements. It is not Goldman Sachs that's making large contributions. It's the PACs that are created by the wealthy individuals who are the employees and the managers of Goldman Sachs. It is not the legal entities that are publicly held and subject to the disclosure requirements that are the source of the greatest problem. In fact, I suggest that if you can talk to them in a way that they can hear, again to quote Larry Lessig, you might even find a few allies among those publicly held corporations. So let me close by just sharing with you a complaint that I have often heard from corporate CEOs and directors. They are very concerned about the corruption problem and they actually don't see themselves as the perpetrators. They often see themselves as the victims. And what they say is, we have to worry because every election season, we have politicians knocking on our doors and saying, you know, you ought to donate money to my campaign because if you don't, then this legislation proposing to regulate your industry is likely to go through. 
And so I think that although there are certainly corporations and even some publicly held corporations that would have CEOs and boards that would cling desperately to the notion that they need to be able to give unlimited amounts to political campaigns and on issue advertising, you might find at least a decent minority of business people with whom you could find a coalition that would support the sort of legislative changes that I was so happy to hear Larry Lessig describing this morning as a means of getting money out of politics. Because public corporations, at least, don't actually want to give away money to anyone. <laughs> right, so thank you. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy, and I'm here to talk to you about the role of nonprofits after Citizens United. And you may uh, take from my uh, talk that I'm anti nonprofit, and that's actually not the case. I am anti multinational corporations hiding behind nonprofits. <laughs> So this is a picture of my father. Um, I was raised by the most dangerous man in America, a educated black man. Um, he was a sculptor and a very creative thinker. And when I was young, he told me to ask the big questions. And I think the big question right now is what is the proper role of corporate money in a democracy? I think one problem with corporate money in a democracy is the effect on the democracy itself. And don't kid yourselves, this is the, the cover of the New York Times the day Nixon resigned. Uh, the stakes are incredibly high here. We've lost uh, a president before because of campaign finance problems. I don't want to have to lose another president because we didn't figure out how to do money in politics in a sane way. And if you are young like I am, I was not alive during Watergate. <laughs> and I recently wrote this law review article. And every time I opened the Senate Select Committee on Watergate, uh, my hair would start to curl. because, And now you can see the result. Um, <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad. Um, and so if you are, you know, if you need a refresher course, Take a look at this. Um, and the reason that I called this How Much is an Ambassadorship is Nixon's fundraisers, uh, they were selling ambassadorships to the highest bidder. And the going rate was a quarter million dollars in 1972 dollars, which is over a million dollars today. The other problem with corporate money in a democracy is that it's not the uh, manager's money to spend. If you're talking about a publicly traded company, then that money is somewhat attributable to shareholders. So that is other people's money, as Justice Brandeis used to say. And I think the big paradigm shift that Citizens United made was actually inside the corporation itself. And here's how it goes. So a CEO before Citizens United, if he wanted to spend money in a federal election, he had to pull out his own personal checkbook, and then he could spend as much as he wanted buying political ads for his favorite political candidates. That was his right under Buckley v. Vallejo. But after Citizens United, he can use his other hand, and he can grab into another pocket, and he can pull out the corporate checkbook. So the corporate checkbook is the one where it has the corporate, the corporate logo on it and where, more importantly, the bill does not go to his house. So behind a corporate checkbook is, as Justice Brandeis said, other people's money. And I think with, when you have other people's money involved, we should have 
stricter regulations. And one of the reasons that you want stricter regulations is the interests of shareholders and corporate managers are not always perfectly aligned. Corporate law recognizes this, and they have special rules when uh, those interests diverge. And I think corporate political spending is one of those instances where the interests of shareholders and managers can diverge. So the manager may want that ambassadorial position. The, the shareholder wants a good stock price. Those are not necessarily the same thing. The other thing that the manager might want is the invitation to the inaugural ball. Um, and so that may be good for the, the manager in his career, but is not necessarily good for his company. For you visual learners out there, um, I wanted to remind you that Citizens United didn't just change federal law, it also changed uh, state law. And so this is what the map looked like before Citizens United. The states in green allowed corporate money and the states in white didn't allow corporate money. And after Citizens United, this is what the map looks like. Corporate money is allowed everywhere, both in federal elections and in state elections. But every uh, dark cloud does have a silver lining. <laughs> and uh, the, the silver lining for me with Citizens United is its holding on disclosure, what, which was uh, eight to one. The one, if you're curious, is Justice Thomas. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think we can take the old lesson from Watergate that if you want to know what's going on in American politics, what you have to do is follow the money. And there are great resources, um, opensecrets.org and uh, followthemoney.org. Uh, Open Secrets uh, tracks money in federal races. Um, follow the Money tracks money in state races. And so this is from uh, this federal election, and this is some money going into uh, super PACs. And this is all publicly traded corporate money. And one of these things is not like the others. It's this one, the Pilot Corporation. They are a Japanese pen company. They gave $100,000 to American Crossroads. And if you'll recall, uh, when President Obama said in his State of the Union, we're, you know, I'm worried that there's going to be foreign money in American elections, and Justice Alito is like shaking his head and mouthing, not true, not true, not true. Well, if there are journalists in the room, please look into this. Please look into this. I, I need to know that this wasn't a Japanese company spending money in my election. So one of the problems with Open Secrets and followthemoney.org, as good as they are, they're only as good as the laws that report um, campaign finance spending. And there are huge loopholes in the disclosure regime. And so this brings me to my favorite obscure Simpsons quote, which is, I can't see through men money, sorry, I can't see through metal, Kent. Um, and the metal that I can't see through are 501c4s and 501c6s. So in 2010, which was the first post-Citizens United election, 42% of the outside spending was dark. In the initial data from this election is that 23% of it is dark, but don't get encouraged because once you look at the aggregate numbers, so in 2010, it was about $135 million was dark. This election, it looks like it's going to be $300 million was dark. And again, the dark things that I can't see through are 501c4s, which are social welfare organizations, and 501c6s, which are trade associations. And here's, here's how they do it, kids. Um, so this is how money from a publicly traded corporation could get into an American election without voters or investors being any the wiser. Okay, so you start at your publicly traded company. They are under no duty to, to disclose at the SEC that they are spending money in politics. 
then it goes to the black box. So either the trade association or the 501c4. The 501c4 or 501c6 does indeed report to the IRS, but that is not reported to the public. Then the trade association buys a television ad, and it will say somewhere on there, brought to you by the Chamber of Commerce, um, but it won't say that it was brought to you by this publicly traded company. And then you say, well, don't we have a federal election commission? And indeed we do. So when the trade association reports at the FEC, it is perfectly legal for them to report, we had a million dollar ad buy, but we have magically zero donors. And the, the way that you get away with this is only earmarked donations have to be reported, and no one clever enough to use this system is stupid enough to earmark. <laughs> so the long story short of all of this is that the public can't tell that a corporation is actually behind a given political ad. And so how could uh, a 28th Amendment change some of this? And it could possibly uh, get all nonprofits out of all politics. It could get some nonprofits out of all politics, or it could get uh, all nonprofits out of some politics, and I guess it could get some nonprofits out of some politics. Um, I don't think it'll actually get all nonprofits out of all politics, in part because nonprofits have very litigious lawyers. I can't see them letting this lie. But one of the equilibriums that might be reached is something that we had for basically a, a quarter of a century between a case called Massachusetts Citizens for Life and Citizens United. So in that uh, time period, the uh, federal law allowed for ideological nonprofits that were individually funded, had no corporate funds in them, to spend in uh, federal elections as if they were individuals. And I think that kind of equilibrium might uh, happen if the Constitution is amended again. The other thing that might happen uh, is if the amended constitution is deemed to overrule Bilotti, then you might, for the first time in a very long time, have ballot initiative fights that didn't have corporations in them and didn't have nonprofits like, and some people think of nonprofits as like teeny tiny entities. Think again. Pharma is a nonprofit under our law. They have been huge in funding many, like 311 California initiatives uh, in the past 11 years. So you might have an entirely different world if you actually took nonprofits out of the ballot initiative process. So, since it may take some time to get a constitutional amendment, some solutions in the meantime. First, we have this notice problem, which is basically that publicly traded corporations don't have to tell their shareholders or the public that they're spending in politics. So I think that the Securities and Exchange Commission needs to promulgate a rule that requires transparency for all corporate political spending. <laughs> and um, the other problem with corporate political spending is from the shareholders' point of view, there is no opportunity to consent in the same way that union members get to like opt in, opt out. There's none of that in, in the corporate world. So a binding shareholder vote, which they have in the UK, I think is well overdue in the United States. And if you need some encouragement, after reading my depressing Watergate piece, if you need some encouragement, look at this piece has the tide turned in favor of disclosure? It actually has. Lower courts after Citizens United have been almost unanimous in upholding disclosure laws. And so the good news, with the exception of the Eighth Circuit, uh, is that disclosure is uh, winning in the courts. And so one of the open questions is, will Congress act on this? Another question is, will our federal agencies act on this? And I'll, because I'm short on time, I'm going to speed up to what I'm working on, which is the petition at the SEC. So I work with a uh, group called the Corporate Reform Coalition, and we have uh, garnered a record-setting 300,000 comments 
at the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have broken the record for the number of comments that have ever come in on a single petition. And I think this issue is at the tipping point. And if you are interested in this, please don't be silent. Don't be so depressed about this stuff that you just you know, give up on the, the public comment process at, at the federal agencies. I think you can really make a difference if you put your name in and tell the SEC we need this type of transparency. So the struggle to uh, turn the lights on in our democracy continue. And th this is my, oh gosh, it's, uh, of course, Microsoft Word is fighting me. Um, but if you want to check out the, the Corporate Reform Coalition, it's just corporatereformcoalition.org. <laughs> Thank you. go with this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Greg Colvin. Um, I was uh, tremendously pleased to be invited and, and uh, requested by Miles. That's good right there. But gosh, was it four months ago to uh, participate in, in getting this uh, panel together and, and in this conference uh, based on uh, a paper that I had done, a, a blog that I posted on ourfuture.org with uh, 12 questions that I thought ought to be addressed by just about anyone who's attempting to draft a constitutional amendment after Citizens United. And I, I wanted to ask such questions as, um, what's the main purpose of the amendment? Um, is it a, to drive big money out of American elections from all sources, or is it to abolish corporate personhood? Another question was, if, if none of the rights extended to corporations are still protected by the Constitution, what would the consequences be outside of the realm of elections? Do we have unintended consequences? Well, um, these um, 12 questions are now um, posed in a more advanced form, and they consist of the straw poll that you'll be addressing in the breakout groups, which I think is great because we have some electronic ability, hopefully, to uh, display pie charts uh, and so on that uh, will will indicate uh, how you view, having gone through this conference, these essential questions of what a constitutional amendment would look like. Well, in this first slide here, uh, you have in the materials that were, um, that were sent out electronically a full set of um, the language and the comparative features of the amendments proposed in Congress uh, prepared by the Center for Media and Democracy as part of the testimony they gave in July, I believe it was, to the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee? Right. And I picked out three just to sort of demonstrate uh, from an analytical level what the main themes are that so far have been part of the process of constitutional amendment drafting. First of all, and this is embodied in the uh, McGovern proposal, ending corporate free speech rights and other constitutional rights. This is, um, I think, pretty much identical to the free speech for people proposal. It doesn't directly address uh, campaign finance, but it addresses only um, ending corporate rights protected by the US Constitution. Secondly, and this is the one that is probably considered the most uh, moderate, is enabling Congress to fully regulate campaign finance by entities, corporations, labor unions, and so on, and by individuals, uh, and this uh, reauthorization would reverse not only the Citizens United case, but also the Buckley case, which uh, had struck down the limits on individual spending. Then lastly, and this is somewhat of a um, different approach, although it tends to blend some of these approaches, uh, Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Ted Deutsch of Florida, and I, public citizen and uh, and uh, Lisa and I had some opportunity to be in touch with the, these offices when they were working on this amendment, that the um, entities that would be banned from political spending would be the for-profit businesses and their C6 associations. 
Uh, there was also provision in the Sanders Deutsch Amendment to, um, as the uh, Udall Amendment would allow Congress to re regulate uh, both individual and, and um, entity spending. Uh, there are a couple others that I think are, are worth noting. They are, um, they are also in the package of materials. One is uh, the move to amend version that I think is circulating now. It combines, no, okay. I'm not there yet. Okay. It combines both the first and the second approaches, both to, to uh, remove corporate, uh, corporately protected constitutional rights from the Constitution, as, as well as to re-enable Congress to regulate campaign finance. Um, but I understand that Free Speech for People actually endorses the Udall Amendment. So in a way, what we have, if you're looking at where things stand right now as of the last congressional session, that Free Speech for People uh, would be supporting two different amendments. Well, move to amend is combine them in, into one. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the one that I drafted two years ago, which basically I was surprised how much it's aligned with what uh, Professor Lessig was saying earlier. My, the theme of the one that I tried my hand at was only citizens can vote, so only citizens should finance campaigns, period. Uh, this would allow, however, public financing but it deals with the question of por corporate political spending by just saying, well, you know, if you're not a citizen, then you can't spend on political. It reduces the marketplace to individual spending. Now the question is, we got Sheldon Adelson. What do we do about <laughs> a citizen who has one vote but $40 million to spend? Um, so I did a, a Citizens Election Amendment 2.0. <laughs> which is just like the first one, but it adds a third clause. And that third clause is there's a limit in how much an individual can spend. And that limit is 10% per year of the median annual household income in the United States. That's about $50,000 is the median household income, so that's about 5,000. So you can spend 5,000 on your city council race, on your favorite presidential candidate, whatever, per year, that's it. I don't know. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to introduce that. That's, that's not going to get cross-partisan support. But it is a marker in a way. If you believe that the constitutional amendment ought to be used to equalize spending on elections to reduce it only to what citizens spend, I think you'd have to do something like that. I don't have the exact, you know, most wonderful formula, but there it is. All right. I'd like to move on to... Um, to kind of speak about what the purpose of this panel was and what we believe that we need to do to advance the movement toward a um, qualitative constitutional amendment. We have not had before the kind of legal scholarship that penetrates into the issues uh, that surround the legal scholarship of, of uh, corporate personhood and corporate rights until we had the three paper, papers done by the, the three lawyers and law professors that are here in front of you. And I do think that um, with this commission legal scholarship, we're going to be able to move beyond the amendments that have been uh, proposed in the past and move toward uh, something that is more advanced and perhaps more likely to attract cross-partisan support. Um, and in a moment, I'll, I'll mention to you what I think is the biggest problem that I realized after reading the three papers we have in front of us if we're going to talk about making a major change to corporate constitutional rights. I have to tell you, as, as full disclosure, my practice is a nonprofit tax exempt lawyer. I, I work for and have for the last 35 years. I have built, maintained, advised, and defended nonprofit corporations. Like Toastmasters International, which has, has 250,000 members worldwide, it's an association. It's not a business corporation. Or like the California Hospital Association, which is a 501c6, it's composed of, about evenly of nonprofit hospitals and for profit hospitals. And with the freedom to do political spending under the Bilotti case, it spent a great deal of money to help pass Prop 30, which taxes the rich in California, 
and at least for the moment, helps to solve the state's budget problems. I guess I have to think about that as a good thing. And again, it is an association. It almost illustrates the complicatedness of solving this problem because some of these associations, C4s, C6s, and so on, have people in them, and they also have for-profit corporations in them. So we have to sort that out in terms of tracing money and, and who's authorized <coughs> to spend. The last one I'll mention is moveon.org. Um, like many advocacy organizations, they're incorporated. Uh, in fact, MoveOn has two corporations, a 527 and a C4. And I've noticed that most of the organizations pushing for a constitutional amendment, including to abolish corporate personhood, as you, as you might say, um, are themselves either incorporated or um, fiscally sponsored by another 501c3 corporation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, I have two slides here. I just wanted to sort of bring, lift out what uh, some of the brand name entities are whose corporate constitutional rights have been recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court. And first, those that are business corporations, Southern Pacific Railroad, that was the Santa Clara case we heard about, First National Bank of Boston, that was the Bilotti case, and then another one involving um, uh, PG&E. But Dow Chemical, Morton Salt, AT&T did not have their corporate constitutional rights upheld by the Supreme Court, indicating, as our speakers have said, that corporations don't always win those cases. Next slide. So then there's the nonprofits. And actually, the initial case about um, corporate rights under the US Constitution was the Dartmouth College case. And what, um, what it was fighting in that case, to, to make it very um, short and clear, is there was an attempt, essentially, to, um, to force Dartmouth College to stop being a private nonprofit and become a public corporation. And uh, John Marshall and the U.S. Supreme Court protected Dartmouth's uh, status as a, as a private nonprofit. United Mine Workers, Greenpeace, Massachusetts Citizen for, for Life, Wisconsin Right to Life, Mission Chamber, Michigan Chamber of Commerce, that's a six. Its members are all businesses. At first, it was required to uh, observe the corporate prohibition on political spending. But of course, that was reversed in Citizens United. So. Uh, we're, we're back to uh, protecting the, the Chamber of Commerce. NAACP versus Alabama, 1958 case, the Supreme Court said your right to uh, keep the names of your members private uh, and not be um, disclosed to the state of Alabama is justified um, on the rights of privacy and association with your members. Okay, here's where I think the task is in the next stage of uh, drafting constitutional amendments. We've heard about associational rights, and Professor Winkler indicated that not only do we have a doctrine of corporations or persons, but also a doctrine of people who associate together, even though it may be in the corporate form, have their individual personal rights translated into the entity in which they've uh, come together and associated. Well. I think there's a very real possibility, in, and this is if you were to choose to go ahead with a constitutional amendment that removes the constitutional rights of corporations and other artificial entities from the Constitution, that those rights would eventually be resurrected completely as association rights. But you could prevent that from happening in the careful drafting of a constitutional amendment that said not only are we uh, not going to permit corporations to have rights under the U.S. Constitution. They may have those rights under state statutes, state constitutions. But um, we're going to limit associational rights to associations of individuals who come together for political and social purposes, not for the purposes of capital gain. And I'm quite familiar with this concept because my world, the tax-exempt nonprofit law world, makes a very clear division between between for-profit uh, organizations that exist among shareholders, partners, and so on to increase uh, through the capitalist process their wealth, converting the work and creativity of their employees and the resources of the earth into private wealth that allows them to become extremely wealthy. That's the principle. That's the capitalist principle for which they associate. I see that as distinct, and so does the Internal Revenue Code, thankfully. 
from human organizations, charitable 501c3 organizations like Toastmasters or uh, the other organizations, Disabled American Veterans. Um, we could go on and on with examples where the reasons for associating are not for capital gain. There are, they are for expressing or protecting economic rights. I wish I could say something about labor unions. I don't think labor unions belong in the same category as the business corporations. And frankly, I'm tired, I don't know about you, of seeing them thrown under the bus. in order to get uh, reforms of these, of these laws. So, uh, you know, I would just leave you with that thought that if we are together in various groups going to work next on what a constitutional amendment should look like and if we're going beyond just citizen funded, only voters can vote, only citizens could vote, only uh, citizens should then finance campaigns and we're also going to address corporate personhood, I think we have to be careful and this was actually uh, what we were trying to do with the Sanders-Deutsch Amendment, which is to make a distinction, a distinction that I think, as, as Lynn was saying, pays attention to the uh, question of what these entities exist for, what human benefits they are designed to confer, and uh, on, the, on the basis of that, make some distinctions about what the Constitution in the future uh, would be there to protect. So thank you. We've, we've had a, an array of um, AV delays, and so uh, we have been granted 15 minutes uh, more, basically, or more or less, to have some questions. And so I think, I think what we'll do is, if folks want to come up to the mics, we'll take five, five or six questions, short questions, and then we'll group those and then, and then, uh, and then have the panelists answer them. So if we get the questions sort of sequentially, and then we'll go have a lovely lunch and continue these conversations in small groups. So if we get five people up to pose some quick questions, then we'll get the panelists and the experts here. Oh, and we'll get some cards from the overflow room. So we've got five people, and or six people, and then we'll just take the questions in quick order. Chink. Hey, uh, I, I know I'm moderating a panel later, but I like to get involved. Um, so. Real quick, uh, if we took away all the constitutional rights of uh, corporations, including property rights, all the ones that were listed, um, is it possible that we could reinsert those uh, through legislative rights, or some which have been mentioned, you know, at the state level, et cetera, or is there something unforeseen, devastating about that? Is there is there a reason we, why we couldn't give them just legislative rights? Okay. So that's one question, just do you know who's going to answer that among you? Do you want to choose it? Or not now, but just so that you know that you're answering I'll it. I'll answer it. But not, but, but not, well, no, but, no, 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 Okay. She's got that one. Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, corporations have fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. That limits their ability to have a conscience in, in, other, uh, in other matters or, it, um, so I'm wondering if there's some way to craft something that would that would attack the per or or that that would limit the personhood due to the fact that the personhood is already limited um, by those con by that constraint. Thanks. Okay, Lynn's got that one. Okay. Right. Question is: Is there an overlap between the functionalist approach that? Um, Lynn Stout was talking about, and, and specifically in regard to publicly owned corporations, and the argument that Professor Lessig was presenting in regard to the corruption of the Constitution, and underlying that is, is there any specific corporations that share that overlap? Um, Norway enabled quotas for gender equality in the 1980s for political parties, and it proved effective and they didn't need to renew the quotas. Is there any way gender quotas in political reform can be incentivized by campaign finance towards uh, equity and governance? Uh, maybe this is a form of uh, Chenk's question, but I was wondering if there's a legal distinction between rights and privileges, and whether the concept that corporations have privileges that come through their charter, and so that really is through the legislative process that we grant these privileges, is different than talking about rights. 
I've heard that distinction made, uh, and I'm not sure that I totally understand it, and I hope you guys do. Oh, thanks, Mary Beth. Who's got that one? Okay. All right. I am not quite sure how to phrase this, but I'm unsettled because I haven't heard the uh, fraudulent claims that mentioned here today. To me, what is a little bit of devil's advocate here, what is most disturbing about what big money does is when it combines with fraudulent claims. Mm -hmm. Take an example of Proposition 37, for example. I don't want to say much about that, but could we possibly today uh, include that in a very major way in when we're talking about big money and dark money? It's not just the big money, it's what the big money is doing with its money. Thank you. So the, so the question on, uh, on uh, false advertising. Okay. Yeah. Looking at this last side, I just get worried of the shift of money from super PACs if it does include associations into the chambers of commerce or ALEC. Mm -hmm. I'll take that one. <laughs> and the last one from this room. Yeah, very quickly. Is the, uh, the, the statement that someone made almost parenthetically uh, that the corporations have fiduciary responsibility to stakeholders, it has become, I, I think, accepted common wisdom that that's the only responsibility they have. That is a myth, is it not? And could someone speak to that? Thank you. Oh, I was going to cover that. So, and we've got, and we've got, we had a, a multitude of questions from the other room. Thank you, the other room. But um, let me just put those, pose those to the panel as well. One question was, can anyone speak to the issue of what other Western nations do in their elections I'll in terms do, I'll, of allowing I'll take corporations? That one. All right. Yeah. And um, and the and the, and the the second question that I've chosen out of this set is is how can a 28th Amendment deal with the revolving door of government lobbying, the issue that uh, Professor Lessig raised? Is there a way to deal with that? So um, we've had these questions. We're just going to start to try to answer some of them. Okay, should I go first? The first question we had was, if we're concerned about the loss of protections to corporations, couldn't they be provided legislatively? And the answer is certainly they could. You could have uh, uh, wonderful laws enacted that gave all the protection to corporations or association that we thought they should have. The question is just, do we trust our legislators to do that? The purpose of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights was out of a fundamental distrust that you could uh, count on the legislators to steer a straight and narrow course. So certainly, if you remove constitutional protections from corporations, that doesn't automatically make everything go to, you know, heck in a handbasket. Uh, it's really a question of what laws are enacted by the legislatures if there's no recourse to the Constitution. Yeah, I'd like to just speak to what is indeed a very common but incorrect belief that corporations have a legal duty to maximize share value. That's actually not c correct. I know I just wrote a book on it called The Shareholder Value Myth. A better way, which I got a plug in for just now, um, but a much better way to understand corporations is that they're actually, they're not things that are owned by shareholders that have to maximize shareholder wealth. They're much more analogous to nation states or other very complex entities. So they control all of these assets, but they also um, involve the participation of many different stakeholders that have a variety of governance rights. So shareholders do get to vote for directors, but in public corporations, shareholders are so dispersed, it's a very weak right. When companies approach insolvency, it's not uncommon for creditors to get voting rights. Consumers obviously get voting rights in the sense they don't have to buy the products. Employees get a lot of input. So it's, it's more valuable, I think, to think of them as these very complex institutional um, institutions that have a lot of stakeholders participating in them. I actually think that's the good news. And I think that with appropriate disclosures, what you can expect is that the involvement of these different human interest groups in corporations, including shareholders, consumers, rank and file employees, and sometimes even the CEOs and directors. I've actually known CEOs and directors to express concern for society's well-being. <laughs> I, I've seen it happen. Um, but it can't happen when we have these, when we have, when, it can't happen when political expenditures are going on in darkness and these various human contributors don't know what's going on, which is why I'm very excited about Kiara's project, but I was also urging her in between. I said, you've got to expand it to include the private companies. The public corporations already are voluntarily, I just looked it up, 60% of Fortune 100 companies already make pretty extensive disclosure of their political, camp, their political contributions. It's not perfect. 
But um, because of the pressure of these stakeholder groups that are already making some voluntary disclosure, if we can't get the sunlight to shine on the private companies and the private associations, we won't have solved the problem. Okay. I just wanted to add one thing to what um, Lynn was saying about, uh, or actually what Barbara was saying about, um, would we be sufficiently protected if legislation were enough to take care of, of corporate rights? And there's one area in which I think it sort of brings the question to a head, and that is the Fifth Amendment eminent domain clause that requires um, compensation for takings of property for public use. If you didn't allow nonprofit or for that matter for profits to rely on the eminent domain clause, there is always the possibility that Congress or one of the state legislatures could, um, in some great distress, such as during World War II when the um, auto companies were ordered to stop making cars and make only tanks and airplanes, to essentially nationalize or confiscate an industry. And if the um, corporations that have had the right to insist on just compensation and eminent domain, no longer had that recourse, then we could at least theoretically, probably wouldn't happen very often, be in a situation where a legislative act to uh, take uh, private corporate property uh, would, would um, not have any uh, backstop, any, any constitutional resource uh, to, to uh, create any other uh, outcome other than that. Now, in my Sandinista days, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> okay, let me respond um, just a bit to the voluntary disclosure point. Um, so thank goodness for Bruce Freed. He has basically single-handedly uh, orchestrated shareholders to ask their corporations to be more transparent. And thank goodness for that. Um, but it is voluntary, which means the moment they get burned because of a particular disclosure, they have the ability to shut up like a clam. And so that's why I think we need regulations at the SEC, we need uh, laws from Congress, and we need laws in states. I do not trust corporations to self-regulate in this area. The other question was, what do other democracies do? And I've done extensive work on what happens in the UK. I think of the UK as almost the bizarro America in terms of how they deal with their elections. Um, because where we have gone this way, they have gone that way. So for example, they call elections with very little notice, which means that you have an election period that only lasts for a couple of weeks compared to the two-year saga <laughs> that we have here. Um, they don't allow television advertising. <laughs> um, you know, they, it's a totally different system. But one of the things that's very similar between the UK and the US are our capital markets. And under the UK Companies Act, which they amended in 2000, it requires uh, both disclosure and consent. So the corporations that spend in politics in the, in the UK disclose down to the pence how much money they spent and where they spent it. And then secondly, they get shareholder approval of corporate political budgets uh, one to four years in advance. And if the managers don't win that shareholder vote, they can't spend that money. As to the question about rights versus privileges, um, well, that's a complex question that legal theorists have been debating for a very long time. Uh, Hofeld pops to mind, privileges, rights, and duties, but I don't think that's probably what you were asking about. Uh, in this context, I would say, this is, this is a complicated question, but I think in broad strokes, privileges is usually used in the language of talking about uh, state charters to form a corporation that states have the prerogative to have a corporation code and allowed people to form corporations. And then once you do form a corporation, you have those characteristics of the corporation 
incidental that I talked about the right to contract in the corporate name and sue and be sued and hold property in the contract in the corporate name. And then as to rights, uh, generally speaking, I, I think that comes up in the discussion of how do we treat corporations under the U.S. Constitution and how do, how do we talk about individuals acting in association. And there, I think we're generally thinking about rights as against the government. And then I think we had a question on uh, false, false advertising or the equivalent of regulating the false advertising in addition to the notion of whether there should be political advertising in the way it happens in the U.S. compared to other countries. But... Um, you know, one of the efforts that Congress has engaged in was the effort to basically have you take ownership of that ad. So you have to disclose at the end of the ad, can, every candidate does, this ad is brought to you by Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, I stand behind this ad. That's not happening in the nonprofit world. Even, and, and I would say beyond the C4 groups, the public uh, welfare groups, but also the C3 groups that are running the issue ads. These are, these are groups where a, uh, an, an organization, an entity can get a, a tax deduction for giving to the C3 organization, the C3 organization can run an enormous amount of, there's been an enormous amount of activity, uh, increasing activity that we've documented at PR Watch, and, um, and there really is very little accountability about the truth of those ads. In fact, they're, in fact I would submit to you that they're almost always misleading. Um, you know that. Uh, they're almost always misle misleading. But I think there's, there has been a, a real reluctance um, from, from the Congress and from the judiciary to try to regulate truth in politics in that sense. And I think that would, there, there's a lot of obstacles to doing so, but one, one approach would be to uh, require that sort of disclosure that would, that would make someone held accountable if they are the liar behind that ad. If, 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 if Sheldon, for example, uh, you know, if Sheldon, for example, had, had, had uh, backed that ad in his own name, what would be the consequences for him or his corporation if it was in his own name and it was deceitful? That's one approach. However, um, there is an effort afoot uh, by the people who have brought to you these decisions, James Bopp and uh, the lawyers for the Wisconsin Right to Life and other groups, to basically suggest that because uh, money is speech in, their, in this vernacular, um, disclosure chills speech. And the thing you cannot do is chill speech. And we've actually been litigating uh, before the courts in DC about this question of whether you can get disclosure and whether, and in essence, whether disclosure will be, will be claimed to be in violation of, their, of the free speech rights of people who want anonymity. So there are some real issues there beyond the fact that groups like Citizens United itself have described themselves as press beyond regulation. Um, and so there are very complicated issues. Let me, um, let me say with respect, and, and, that, and that I think goes to the question of the US Chamber of Commerce and ALEC and other groups. ALEC doesn't actually play in elections that way. But the US Chamber of Commerce, it is the case that we have a shell game operation happening in essence where corporations are giving to one group that gives to another group that gives to another group. And, and you cannot uncloak it through ordinary investigative means, although we do and our, our hard work and others do their hard work on that. But let me just wrap up this by saying two quick things. There are regulatory measures that have been proposed and Greg Colvin has, um, has been working on some of those with respect to the IRS in terms of the types of groups who are nonprofits and how they can allocate their money to activity that is not disclosed but clearly is designed to influence the elections. And so Greg, I wanted to make sure that you could, you could mention that beyond what I've just mentioned. And then I just want to say there's, there are questions from OWS who's been tremendous in moving forward the idea of money out, voters in, and a lot of questions we didn't get to. And I hope that with Mary Beth's help and others, we can have an online conversation that continues to debate these. And so let me just give Greg the last word. Well, just two thoughts on, on relevant legislative changes, or for that matter, IRS regulation changes. <coughs> First of all, as some of you may know, 501c4 and c6 groups um, could spend up to 49% of their total uh, money in a year for political influence. This is uh, how the IRS appears to treat the question of what is a secondary activity. So if your primary activity, 51% of what you're spending is lobbying or uh, for some sort of social benefit, then you could shelter as much as 49% of your total budget in a year for issue, uh, well, for explicit ads um, favoring or opposing candidates. Um, I, I uh, published a blog suggesting that that be lowered to something like 5 or 10 percent. <laughs> so that's one thing. Another is that we are laboring, at least in the tax-exempt world, under a, a very vague facts and circumstances test about what is and is not a political communication or political intervention. 
And as a result of that, you see these uh, sort of sham issue ads that don't have express advocacy in them. But the IRS doesn't have clear rules for when you cross the line. And I um, actually chair a drafting committee that is working uh, now under the leadership of a public citizen to propose to the IRS a good set of regulations as we have for lobbying, which would define that line between what's partisan and what is nonpartisan. And that that would create a level playing field and a, a good set of rules that uh, allow the IRS to become the, um, the umpire that it should in terms of tax exempt groups and be able to distinguish uh,